we have the very nature of God within us, Peter says in, in 2 Peter. But we're not tapping into that yep. because of we don't know the Word of God. We don't know the power of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit. And we don't believe that God wants to give us fresh revelation um, to create. This goes back to entrepreneurialism. I believe the Holy Spirit is also the spirit of entrepreneurialism. Oh, absolutely. Because he's the creative spirit. Please be so kind to support us by clicking the like button and subscribing to our channel to be notified of all future content. Hello everyone and welcome to this next episode of the KOG, that is the Kingdom of God Entrepreneur Show. I am your host, Stephen Harris, and today in this direction, the man, the myth, and the legend, Dr. Dan Yule Gilbert is here with us. And this is very personal to me because Dr. Gilbert was actually my dean back in my Bible college days. I went to what was then called the King's College and Seminary, then became the King's University. I call it Jack Hayford University because yeah. hey, Jack yeah. Hayford's the man, and uh, I was honored to be out of school. But anyway, Dr. Gilbert not only was my dean for that period of time, but after college, uh, I, I connected with him again, and he became one of my very first business mentors. So uh, anyway, let me give the, the formal respects to you, sir. This is Dr. Daniel Gilbert. He's the founder and CEO of Empowered Living International Ministries, and he is the assistant professor at Regent University School of Divinity. Welcome, sir. Wow, thank you so much, Stephen. It's such a great time to reconnect with you. And I know we've been talking a little bit in the past about doing something like this. And I'm so proud of you and all that oh, you have you, done, sir. what God has done in your life from, from the small times, as well as all the ministry that you've done, both in California and now um, where you're located. And and what you're doing with your new wife, a new, you're a new father. It's so great to see you on Facebook with your, <laughs> those beautiful pictures. And, but even more so, your heart to help uh, build and, and expand the kingdom of God, as well as encourage those individuals that, that are, being, are being prompted by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, to, to take that step of faith and start a business, whether it's an online business or or a mom and pop shop, or or whatever it might be, and uh, you're you're going to have a great impact in this world because of your faithfulness, and it's oh. a joy to be with you. Well, thank you. I'm very humbled by that. I appreciate that. You know, again, because of the affinity I had for you, it it really means a lot to uh, hear that because you've seen me for goodness. That's got to yeah. be tw 16 years now. I think it was 2005 that, when I met you. That's right, so, uh, 2005 when we first met. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Wow. And so to the audience, so again, he's one of my first business mentors. I've learned so much from him uh, having meetings years ago. Me and my friend started a, uh, it was a YouTube uh, video production company. It was what, the first official, it was a, an S corporation, the first official right. corporation I ever started. And, um, you know, you were right there with us helping us through that. Uh, unfortunately for us, it didn't last for right. a number of reasons. We, I think we really just didn't have the discipline or, <laughs> you know, we got into something we hadn't really weighed out the cost for, but uh, you were there for us from the time it started all the way through, uh, you know, it ending. And so I, I really appreciated that. And, and again, this, we could go in so many different directions having right. you here, but the reason why you are here specifically today, aside from you being so awesome, is you are an author of an amazing book called The Big Five. So when I read this book, it blew my mind, um, you know, and I, I bought it a year ago. And, and uh, you know, because of circumstances, we haven't been able to connect like we are now. But uh, it really challenged me in so many ways because it is a message that is so relevant for today. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I want to let you do the talking now and let's, let's, let's go ahead from there. Cause there's so much to unpack and I want you to do your thing. Well, thanks so much, Stephen. Once again, it's just an honor to be with you mm -hmm. and, and your audience and 
the big five uh, stemmed from my pastoral uh, ministry in California and just seeing how the, the common Christian did not understand just five of the basic essentials of the Christian faith. These aren't all the essentials, but there are five basic essentials of the Christian faith that have been, that got mucked up through the centuries or, or just kind of um, lost, haven't been really taught on a regular basis because of life and because of the direction of the church. And, and so I felt that this was something that, that every Christian should know. And that's the subtitle, five, uh, five foundations every Christian should know. And it's really amazing because I believe this crosses all denominational lines. Uh, whatever affiliation you, you grew up in, uh, these are five essentials of the Christian faith that every Christian should know. And especially during this time in the life of the world, in the end times, yeah. uh, where the church is getting, getting off kilter in yeah. many, many ways. Um, yep. And we need an anchor. We need to find something that can, we can hold on to. And that's, first of all, Jesus Christ, but also the Word of God, the Bible. And that's uh, the first couple of chapters are on the Bible and why the Bible uh, is, is inspired and infallible and errant. And so uh, this is just a very, I believe it's a, it's the signs of the times. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to start another book I'm working on working on uh, a brand new book. I just signed a contract with the publisher uh, today, actually, okay. as we're speaking, and uh, it's going to be on the Holy Spirit because that's one of the main courses I teach in seminary is pneumatology. It's the um, big term, theological term for really the study of the person and work of the Holy Spirit, the third person, the Holy Trinity. So I'm working, I just signed a contract. I'll start working on that tomorrow. Wow. Uh, Congratulations. At the same time, I'm working on another book um, that uh, the working title is the, um, the Spirit of Truth in the Age of Deception. Hmm. And, um, but really, the big five lays the foundation for everything that else that I'll be writing. Because if we don't know the foundations of our Christian faith, how can we build upon that? If we don't know the foundations and we don't believe that the Bible is the very word of God, then how can we trust uh, who Jesus Christ is? How can we trust our salvation in Christ and what he did on the cross? How can we really know we have enough faith to, to live a life of faith if we yeah. don't believe the word of God, it, the Bible is the very word of God, the in, inspired, infallible, and the eternal and errant word of God. I mean, this is something that has been lost or questioned, uh, not just in this age, but especially in the modern era and now the postmodern age that we're in. So that's yeah. really the main reason for the book is it was written for every Christian, it's, it isn't written for a theologian like me. Uh, it, it's written for the common Christian that wants to understand what are some of the foundations of the faith that I believe in. And, and it has a Bible study, uh, questions at the end that you can do individually or in small groups. Yeah. So uh, that's a little bit. I'll answer any questions you have. I, I don't want to... You know, and if I may add to what you're saying, because the premise of this is we had the, the Catholic Church was the church for goodness from, I guess, from the time of Acts chapter two through the Protestant Reformation for the most part, right? You had, you know, yeah, like, I would say, I would say really from the second, third century when okay, I see what you're seeing saying. the church, you know, solidify and, and becoming more hierarchical in their, in their church government and polity. Yes, yeah. until the Reformation period. Now, these, these five um, uh, foundations, the, the big five, uh, were still a part, but they got, they got um, overlooked or it got yeah. muddy in that. Let me uh, turn it back over to you. Sorry. Yeah, no, I understand. And, and, and that's what I was hitting on because when uh, Luther... Um, you know, Martin Luther, you know, it's like Martin Luther King was named after Martin Luther, yes. right? So Martin Luther, right. the great reformer, 
was um, the one who spoke out against the, 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 I guess you would say the bad teachings and the, 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 the fallacies and, and the practices. hierarchical yes. issues that you were talking about, right? It became yes. about, we need to get the word in the hands of the people in the common language. That's exactly and So right. you had this breakout from the, the Catholic church to Protestantism as we know it today, but there were these five tenets, the big five, Right. And that is what they were able to use foundationally to create a new movement. But unfortunately, exactly even right. in less, the last 15, 20 years, we've gotten so convoluted by all kinds of different outside oh. influences that it, it's not like, uh, what does the scripture say about this? So what, what is the truth of it? What is the deception, right? It's just kind of we, oh, you got Jesus, you got good intentions. Let's go down that rabbit trail. And, you know, <laughs> that becomes an entire subculture that, kind of takes over because they got great marketing and everybody's high on emotions or whatever. Oh boy, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head, Stephen. Yeah. It's, you know, new ages has entered into the, the church and, and just bad teachings. And, and yeah. we put more emphasis on experience than on truth. Yeah. Well, my truth, your truth, that's a phrase now that's really big uh, in, in both the media and Hollywood and entertainment. Well, my truth is da 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 and say, great, my truth is da, 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 da. Wait a second. If they're totally opposing, they can't be both true. Yeah. So where is the truth and where does the truth come from? Well, yeah. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's one of the big five. And in the Latin, it's called uh, solus Christus, hmm. uh, Christ alone for our salvation yeah. and so so martin luther uh and then the other reformers that followed him uh all started really emphasizing some of these uh these five big five foundations of the christian faith that were not new they were just uh they were making they were reviving them and making them uh, on the forefront of the christian faith to lead people uh, to a more personal relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, because I believe John Wesley was very big on that whole thing as well, right? John Wesley in, in the 1700s, absolutely. And, yeah. Um, and so you see the, these aspects, and Charles Wesley, who wrote a lot of the hymns, you you listen and or even read some of the of his hymns, they are based on on these big five, and it's yeah. amazing. And yet they're they're called Wesleyans or you know Methodist, um, and yeah. uh, and some Wesleyans say, well, we don't hold to the big five. Yes, you do. <laughs> your father, your the founding fathers of Wesleyanism and Methodism held to the big five. You know yeah. they're not new. Um, they just uh, there's just misperceptions and misunderstandings. So yeah, uh, if you want me just to run through quickly the the big Please. five what they are, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Um, and give you if you want me to do a little history of each one, I can do that too. Yeah, so, please. And, and you know, we'll definitely it will be a discussion. But yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, the, the first big five, as I already started, is sola scriptura, uh, scripture alone. And what Luther and the other reformers uh, felt was there was there was too many messages out there that it brought confusion. Was the Pope the final authority on everything, or was the Church and and the Church leadership making the decision uh, from the Pope? The or was all the tradition? Were all the traditions of the Church have? more authority than the Bible, or were mm. they equal authority, either more authority or equal authority with the Bible? And as Luther, as the founder of the Reformation period, uh, continued to study the word, uh, he was crying out to, to know God. He saw God as, a, as an angry, wrathful God who you could never really know whether you were saved or not. And if you study Martin Luther's life, you, you see him traveling all over, going down to Rome, uh, Rome and, and uh, crawling on his hands and knees for miles just to try to, to get rid of, uh, of the sin in his life and hmm. trying to, trying to make, uh, make himself righteous before 
uh, this God that he had a misperception of who God was. And, yeah. and yet he was a theologian and a New Testament professor. <laughs> so he, he was so yeah. intense and he even flogged himself and um, to try to beat the sin out of him. And, uh, and so he had a misperception. And, and then as he was studying, he was going through the, the gospel or the epistle of Romans and he was teaching in the class on Romans uh, in, in the university. Hmm. And the Holy Spirit arrested him in wow. um, Romans 1, um, 16 and 17, that uh, if I can recall real quick, um, I'm, a, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it as the power to save. And it goes on and hmm. says, for the righteous shall live by faith. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit revealed to him, he can't work or do anything. To, to be saved. It's only by faith through grace. Now I'm jumping ahead of the big in the big five, but yeah, but it was because he realized, and you said this early on in our discussion, that uh, it was they realized they people didn't know the Bible. And so there's this argument about what has more authority, the church over the Bible, or does the Bible have more authority over the church? Hmm. And, and so, and then who chooses? And Luther and the other reformers saying, we must submit all of our life and our, our practices, our feelings, our theology on the word of God. The, the Bible is the sole authority for life and practice. Amen. And therefore, if the church makes a declaration Whatever church, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church or uh, a, a new Protestant church, if any of the church leadership makes a declaration that is contrary to the word of God, then that declaration is false and not, uh, not appropriate to follow or that practice, whatever. So that's what Sola Scriptura is. And giving you a little bit of the history and now up to today. Again, so many people say, well, that's your interpretation, Stephen, um, that and that's your interpretation, Dr. Gilbert, and that's your interpretation, John and Sue and Betty and uh, whomever. Um, no, there are universal principles to Bible study, and uh, when you follow the universal principles to Bible study, then you're not going, they're like railings on a bridge, and uh, you might, as you study the word, but you follow the universal principles of Bible study and you hold to the word of God as being infallible, uh, inspired, infallible, and inerrant, the original inerrant, then you're able to go, wow, I can trust the word of God. Amen. I can trust the God who wrote the word through holy men. And by the way, and women, because there's women uh, prophecies and uh, uh, prophetic um, uh, prophetesses and and other women that spoke and and they they are recorded. So women are a part of the the inspired text. That's what's so beautiful about God, and yeah. and so um, so you have you can trust not just the Bible. You can trust the God of the Bible, and and then you submit your feelings, you submit your frustrations, you submit any practices that, uh, that are behaviors that you have fallen into that, that are grievous to God, and you learn to trust God and his word. That's sola scriptura. Yeah. And then you have a, a, a plumb line when you learn how to study the Bible. And in, in uh, one of my chapters, I give you just some quick key pointers on how to study the Bible properly, those universal principles to Bible study. Just a very quick, there's some great other books written on it, and I have those sources uh, listed. Uh, but I give you a quick understanding of how to study the Bible. And that way it gives people that, that guidance and that assurance that even if I mess up, I'm within the boundaries of, of, the, of, the, um, of the principles for proper interpretation. 
And, um, and it really brings peace. It brings guidance. And then when we hear false teachings or we have a check, well, I don't know about that. Or, or if, if you believe in present day prophecies and so forth, then, um, which I, which I do as yeah, well. Absolutely, yeah. uh, but uh, then you have the word to test it. You always check. And by the way, I say this in all my classes, especially my, the Holy Spirit class I teach, um, the Holy Spirit will never, ever tell you to do something or act some way or, uh, or, or say something that is contrary to the word of God. Correct. Yep. And I've heard the plumb line I've, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I've heard so many people say, well, the Lord told me that my wife's the wrong person and I need to marry my secretary. No, the Lord didn't tell you that. No, your, your, uh, your lust and your yeah. sexual immorality is telling you that. And the devil's telling you that the Bible doesn't say that. So yeah, you know, that, oh, yeah. that's the solo script core. I hope that helps uh, with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like we're saying, it's the plumb line. And, and that's that's one of the things because the art of studying the Bible, unfortunately, isn't very popular right now, right? People just yes. want to take the passages that are like, you know, going to make everybody feel good about themselves and talk right. about the prosperity, the health and wealth and all that, which is part of it, right? We can't negate that message because it goes to the extreme, you know, because I... <laughs> yeah, anything that goes to the extreme is unbalanced. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I've literally been to uh, Bible studies with people of a certain denomination who the word works is the worst. Oh, my goodness. I mean, and you go into the house, it's like a large house and yeah. somebody had to work hard to earn all this stuff. Right. They just right. didn't inherit all this money and buy these big pianos and stuff. Right. And this two story house in Northridge, California, you know, you know, the parts of Northridge I'm talking about, you, you know, those are houses that are probably going for a million dollars these days. And Somebody had to work for that, right? But the word works to some groups of people is like, oh, no, no, no. And they just want to beat themselves up because they take right. certain passages that are things Jesus said and they take it out of context. And Right. You, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I it's know. interesting because you get both sides. But what is the whole picture here? Yes. Right. And that, that's, that's the beautiful thing. You have to take the whole counsel of the word of God. I love that phrase. You have to study the whole counsel of the word of God. You can't just take one or two verses and make a doctrine out of it. And yeah. then, and then, uh, you know, start teaching on this. When you're, if you take a scripture out of context, it becomes a pretext. Yeah. So you have to keep scripture within the context of the original and who the, uh, you know, all these, uh, all these wonderful principles, read, read the book, uh, read, I think it's chapter three, uh, <laughs> talks about some of the principles and they're simple principles are not some, uh, it's, they're principles that every Christian should know how to study the Bible, not just read the Bible, but study the Bible. And it's what's, what's so beautiful about the universal principles of Bible study regarding the railings. Stephen, you, you and I may be studying the same passage, and we're following the principles of Bible study. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you and show you things that I don't see right away. Yeah. And, and so you come from all the observation. It's called observation, observation, observation. Uh, what does the text say? Not, does, not what it means. What does it say? That's observation. That should be most of your study. And there's a slew of questions that follow the observation. And then it's, it's interpretation. What does it mean? That's the second principle. Um, and that's where we begin to interpret the meaning of the text within the context, the historical literary yeah. context. And then application. Uh, what does it mean for me today? Or what does it mean for the church today? So after we study the same passage, you may come to a conclusion or uh, a revelation, if you will, that certain aspects of this passage means this, and it's on the left side of the railing. And I come and I say, well, Stephen, that's interesting. I got it. I have it to understand it this way. And I'm on the right side of the railing, but it's within the boundaries. And so right, what's yeah. happening is we're not speaking to uh, opposite truths. They're, they I would say they're the same truth or the same coin, two sides of the different coin, but they're not in opposites. 
Yeah. Because they're within the boundaries and you, you have followed the universal principles of Bible study. And then I go, oh, now I see what you're saying. And you go, oh, now I see what you're saying. And now we're in unity and we have a fuller grasp of the understanding of that passage because we followed it and because we believe it is the very word of God. It's wow. not just inspired um, it is more than that inspiration. By the way, the word inspired in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 and 17, um, literally means God breathed. Hmm. God breathed. That's the Greek understanding of inspired. Um, and so um, be better translations today actually use God breathed. Hmm. And because that's literally what it means. Interesting. And so scripture is God breathed. Uh, it's not just inspired, and that's why we can hold to it, and we can trust the word because God is faithful. God is true. He cannot lie. He reveals who he is in the word, and then he Amen. sent the living word, Jesus Christ, solus Christus, Christ alone, to reveal who the Father is and to solidify the, the written word through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, from uh, all the New Testament uh, authors. So it's, it's just so beautiful when you study that. Um, yeah. So that's Sola Scriptura. Awesome. Yeah, no, I'm glad you said that because even like one of the things regarding the kingdom of God, one of the verses that has really transformed my thinking, Luke 17, 21, Jesus rebuking the Pharisees yes. says, you know, don't look there. The kingdom of God is within you. The word within is the same word from another passage in Matthew regarding the inside of a cup, right? I got a cup here. Yes, that's um, right. You know, I was drinking coffee. If you see all that nasty stuff on the bottom. But anyway, the idea is Jesus speaking to these non-believers, the kingdom of God is within you. So I take that as the Holy Spirit within us is one thing, right? We get that in Christianity, but the kingdom of God, right? So the kingdom of God, if we boil it down to stewardship, multiplication over the dominion of the earth, there's a lot of non-believers who really understand those principles and we're yes, subservient to them and their industries, their technologies, their yeah. things. Why? Because they understand stewardship and multiplication. The kingdom right. of God is within them just as their fingerprints are unique to them, the irises of their eyes. And so, again, that's I, I love the way you're describing it because most people read through that and don't think anything of it. Right. But to me, it sticks out like a sore thumb, like, whoa, this is deep. Why isn't anybody talking about it? <laughs> and then what, what happens, Stephen, when we understand the principles of the kingdom of God that are, uh, anybody can enter in, if you will, uh, the principles of the kingdom of God. That's what you're talking about. Exactly. Put to practice the principles of the kingdom of God. Pat Robertson, in, in one of his first books, The Secret Kingdom, mm -hmm. is all about that. If, wow. uh, the, the law of reciprocity. If you give, you then give you right? will get back. I mean, Jesus talks about that in Luke as well. And yeah. uh, give, press down, shaken together, running over, uh, yeah. will come back into your lap. That's what Jesus says. So that's a universal principle mm -hmm. uh, of the kingdom. So anybody yeah. that, that gives generously, uh, usually not with, well, I'm, I want to get back from it. Yeah. No, they, they see a need, the poor or whatever, and they give, then God honors that. Now, how much more, Stephen, when people come to know Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes into them exactly. and brings the kingdom of God to make it alive within us yeah. so that now it's sanctified within us through the Holy Spirit. Why aren't we, uh, you know, moving the mountains? Why aren't we building the spaceship? Why aren't we? I mean, we're, we're the ones that we have the, the very, the, this is what I teach on the Holy Spirit class too. This is what you're getting me excited, Stephen. Just think about it. Christians have the Holy Spirit, the third person, the Holy Trinity within us when we come to Christ. Yeah. He's the creative spirit. Look at the world. Look at the universe. God created the universe. In the beginning, Elohim uh, created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. And the Ruach, Elohim, the spirit of God was hovering over the darkness, over the waters. 
<laughs> I mean, and so yeah. the Holy Spirit, through the spoken word, Jesus Christ, the Logos, uh, uh, create the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, create this universe. And when we come to Christ, we have the very nature of God within us, Peter says in, in 2 Peter. But we're not tapping into that yep. because of we don't know the word of God. We don't know the power of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit. And we don't believe that God wants to give us fresh revelation um, to create. This goes back to entrepreneurialism. I believe the Holy Spirit is also the spirit of entrepreneurialism. Oh, absolutely. Because he's the creative spirit. And if you, uh, even if you don't know Jesus Christ, I don't believe the Holy Spirit's in anybody that doesn't know Jesus Christ. I yeah. don't believe that. The I Holy Spirit's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. But the Holy Spirit can still inspire people, give ideas to people if they open themselves up yeah. to, to the creativity that God wants to give. I mean, just look at, say, Leon Musk, for example. I don't. Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah. And I understand. Elon yeah. Musk of, of Tesla and, and what he's doing. I mean, he's brilliant what he's thinking. He's thinking outside the box. Yeah. I believe the Holy Spirit is giving him ideas. Now, there's also, you know, demonic influence and so forth that gives ideas, but we're not going there. We're talking about the kingdom of God and the principles of the kingdom of God. So, it, but it's all based on when we as believers understand the principles of the kingdom of God, the sky's the limit. Hmm. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. I think that's what you're saying too, right? Oh, amen. Amen. Absolutely. Wow, this has been such an awesome talk. And, you know, unfortunately, we're running out of time yes. here. But, um, uh, yeah, there's just, again, like I said, with you, it's like we can go in so many yeah. different directions. Well, we but, might um, have to have another one of these. Oh, I would love um, to. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and we're going to have the link for this yes. book below. So, uh, so buy much. it, read it. It's going to inspire you. Trust me. But uh, what were you about to say? I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say the if I'll just run through the other five, not tell him, but um, so sola scriptura, solus Christus, that's Christ alone for our salvation, grace alone, uh, that we're saved by grace, it's not by works, faith alone, it takes faith, and these are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then this is what I love. I love the last one, soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. Everything mm. that we do in work, in our home, in relationships. Whatever we do, we should do for the glory of God. Amen. So that's what that's what the book is about. And I would also encourage you to go to our website, empowered-living.org, empowered-living.org, and see what we're doing overseas. Our main focus is educating and educating, equipping, and empowering village pastors who have no opportunity to go to Bible school. We also help orphans and do water works and other humanitarian work and It'd be great to, to see some of your, uh, your um, viewers to, to partner with us to change the world for Jesus Christ. God has so much. And let me just say this real quick to everybody. God has so much for you. And he, he wants to use you to have a, an eternal impact in this life. And if you'll just trust him, even today, just trust him and turn to Jesus and recognize that you don't, you know, that you've made mistakes, you've sinned, you've messed up. We all have. But Jesus died for our sins. And God raised him from the dead physically that we might have life and life more abundantly. Amen. And you can be saved and have eternal life. And you can enter into the kingdom um, even now. And one last thing. Stephen is a great man of God. And he's a great businessman and entrepreneur. So I believe you can trust him with the guests that he has on and, and uh, follow him and, and converse with him and see what God would do. Uh, maybe the Lord is, would partner uh, you with him in some business endeavor uh, because he is a righteous man and a man of integrity. Appreciate those kind words. Well, thank you very much, sir. Um, would you mind closing us out in a prayer? I would love to. And once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Lord, I thank you so much for this special time with Stephen. I thank you for the kingdom of God, entrepreneurialism. 
I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in his life and his precious wife's life. I thank you for their new son. I pray blessing upon them. And Lord, for all the viewers, I just ask that you would bless them. Give them that creativity in their hearts. Let them turn to you and seek you for counsel and learn the big five. Help them understand the big five. Yes, Lord. That they may be, be solid in their faith and build on this foundation that they can soar into the heights that you have for them. I bless them now in the name of of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, Dr. Gilbert, it's been an honor to have you. It's, it's great to be able to catch up and, and to yes. uh, just to see what God is doing in your life. So I rejoice for you as just a gift from God. And again, thank you for being on the show. And well, I do you. hope we can have you back. I would love to be back. The Lord bless you and all your audience. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, amen. Well, everybody, it was great to have you again to join us for this episode of the Kingdom of God Entrepreneur Show. And, uh, you know, I always want to conclude by saying, one, go out, be fruitful and multiply. And remember, the Kingdom of God is within you always. God bless. And we'll see you next time.